Hey everyone, Adam Simmons here from DGTL Infra, short for Digital Infrastructure. Small cells and distributed antenna systems are being deployed in cities and towns across the United States. Indeed, many people are asking, what are small cells and distributed antenna systems, and what do they do? In this video, we answer these important questions because small cells and distributed antenna systems impact your ability to stay connected to the network and use services on your smartphone that matter most to you. So let's start off by differentiating small cells and distributed antenna systems, which in the short form is DAS or DAS. Starting with small cells, they can also be referred to as Outdoor Distributed Antenna Systems, or DAS, but for ease, we will distinguish small cells as providing coverage and capacity outdoors. Distributed Antenna Systems, or DAS on the other hand, can also be referred to as Indoor DAS, but for ease, we will refer to all indoor forms of coverage and capacity as simply Distributed Antenna Systems, or DAS. So now with the definitions out of the way, small cells and distributed antenna systems represent a focused way of enhancing network coverage and capacity. Both systems consist of individual antennas placed at low elevations relative to the wireless user. Small cells and distributed antenna systems allow for densification of wireless networks, enabling the widespread adoption of 5G wireless networks. Let's walk through an example of Phoenix, Arizona to help answer one of the most common questions being, why do we need small cells and distributed antenna systems? We will specifically use the example of small cells in an outdoor environment, but the same takeaways apply to distributed antenna systems or DAS in an indoor environment as well. So outside of its downtown area, Phoenix in Arizona and its surrounding suburbs, including Chandler and Scottsdale, are largely residential communities. Indeed, these suburbs of Phoenix have numerous cellular towers that provide wireless voice and data coverage to their respective communities. For this example, we will pick one cellular tower in one suburb of Phoenix. On this tower are several antennas owned by the wireless carriers like Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile that serve the Phoenix area. These antennas broadcast and pick up signals from the people living in Phoenix's devices, then transmits that data it receives to adjacent equipment nearby the tower, and then a wired connection transmits that information onto the internet or phone system. When this tower was originally built, over 20 years ago, it served the residents of Phoenix well. People were using cell phones to talk and text with barely any issues. Besides experiencing a few dead zones and limited coverage areas, this tower in Phoenix provided good, reliable service that kept its residents connected. However, today the devices that Phoenix residents have are not always connecting to the network. Phoenix's population has grown throughout the years, and its residents have begun to notice that even when their device shows that it has a signal, they are not always able to connect to the network. Years ago, cell phone users in Phoenix had no problems connecting to the wireless carrier's networks. But as more people use more data, some users are not able to connect to the network. So what happened? Firstly, people today have more powerful smartphones and are using significantly more data. Users are streaming music on Spotify, video conferencing with friends or coworkers over Zoom, and watching and posting large videos on YouTube. Secondly, many residents of Phoenix also have multiple devices that now connect to the cellular network. Not only smartphones, but also tablets, smartwatches, and even connected cars. So why is this causing problems now? And this brings us to really two important concepts for providing wireless users with optimal service. And notably, they are coverage and capacity. While these two concepts are related, the causes and solutions for each can differ. Coverage is the area that a particular type of digital infrastructure covers, meaning how far the signal reaches. Using the example of the tower in Phoenix, this is able to send its signals across hundreds of homes in a one mile to two mile radius. Indeed, there are few areas with hills and tall buildings which can cause the signal to drop. However, Phoenix's coverage overall does not change. 
Capacity becomes evident if you have ever had full bars on your device, but cannot place a call or load a web page. Indeed, this means you have coverage, but not capacity. This is because you are not having an issue connecting to the network, but for some reason your data is not getting through. So why does this happen? Wireless density is the answer, whereby the wireless signals that connect the tower to the device of a resident in Phoenix are only capable of carrying so much data at once. Indeed, the more data and devices people use on the network, the slower everyone's connections become. To solve this problem, more wireless density needs to be added to the networks that serve Phoenix. But what is the solution to adding more wireless density to Phoenix? Given the challenges that Phoenix faces, this is an ideal solution for what is known as a small cell network to be built. Specifically, a small cell network consists of a series of small, low-powered antennas, often called nodes, that provide coverage and capacity in a similar way to a tower, with a few important differences. Small cells are always connected by fiber optic cable and attached to city infrastructure like streetlights, utility poles, light poles, and slimline poles as well. There's a good chance that you have actually walked by these small cells before and never even noticed. In turn, small cells are more discreet to local residents, while also bringing them closer to smartphones and other devices, which improves both coverage and capacity. Similar to a tower though, small cell nodes communicate wirelessly over radio waves and then send the signals to the internet or phone system. An additional benefit of small cells is that because they are connected with fiber as opposed to copper, they are able to handle massive amounts of data at very fast speeds. So now if we think a bit about wireless density, with the frequency bands that carriers currently use to transmit their signals. If too many people are connected at once, data rates can slow down. By adding small cell nodes, Phoenix can increase its wireless density significantly and is able to handle many more simultaneous connections. Each small cell node is capable of sending and receiving the same amount of data as the tower, but since each small cell covers a smaller geographic area, it is much less likely that any one small cell node will become capacity constrained. Therefore, with small cells, network capacity in Phoenix is improved. Additionally, coverage improvements are another important benefit of small cells. Previously, the network in Phoenix originated from one location, being the cellular tower. The tower covered a broad geography, but in certain areas of Phoenix, such as behind a building, the signal would get lost. But now with small cells, the signal in Phoenix originates from many separate locations, being the small cell nodes, most of which are much closer to the devices. In turn, this proximity to user devices provides much more consistent coverage throughout Phoenix. Indeed, small cells are also a form of shared infrastructure, meaning that multiple wireless carriers like Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile can be accommodated on the same pole. This maximizes the benefits for residents, regardless of which company they get their wireless service from. With a small cell network, Phoenix residents can now use their device and fully embrace the newest technologies like 5G. With that basic overview of small cells in mind, let's jump into some more of the detail behind both small cells and distributed antenna systems. Specifically, we will break this section down into a brief overview, description of the physical asset, identifying who the key customers are, highlighting what a typical contract term is, and finally isolating who the main providers of both small cells and distributed antenna systems are. So starting with small cells, and some of this will be a review of what we just spoke about, but it's important for comparability of small cells to distributed antenna systems. So small cells are small, low-powered antennas, also referred to as nodes. They're connected via fiber optic cables that is typically deployed in dense configurations and closer to wireless customers than tower sites. Specific examples of small cells are microcells, picocells, and femtocells. Small cells are up to 15 feet in height and located closer to where mobile customers need to connect to the network. Small cells bring wireless signals into areas that need better coverage or more capacity. 
small cells can provide coverage for more than 100 users in about a 1,000 foot radius versus a cellular tower site that can support more than 1,000 users in a one mile to two mile radius. Therefore, tower sites provide what's known as blanket coverage, and small cells can then be deployed to augment that blanket coverage in high population density areas where specific capacity needs exist. If we think about the physical asset of a small cell, small cells consist of antennas and equipment deployed along a city block or travel corridor. Often, small cells are mounted onto street lights, utility poles, light poles, and slimline poles, with antennas operating on high band or millimeter wave spectrum. Small cells are typically hidden in this city infrastructure, which makes them easier to be accepted in urban areas. Finally, small cells require radios to be co-located near each antenna, which is different from DAS, which we'll speak about later. In terms of customers for small cells, the major customers are the wireless carriers. Think Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. Wireless carriers use small cells as an effective means for both coverage and capacity. Coverage applications for small cells are in very specific outdoor areas that need coverage or in outdoor areas with difficult zoning restrictions. For example, certain cities make obtaining zoning approval for a tower too difficult. Because small cell antennas are positioned as individual antennas on low elevation structures rather than as highly visible arrays like cellular towers, zoning authorities that are resistant to towers are often more accepting of small cells because they are easier to blend in to the aesthetic of a city. Additionally, in very dense cities like New York, space constraints prevent the installation of larger equipment like towers in the middle of the city. Therefore, small cells, which are physically smaller, can be deployed at street level in New York. So that's some of the coverage rationale for small cells. And then in terms of capacity, small cells are used for what is known as capacity offload, which reduces the amount of data being carried on cellular towers and moves it to small cells. Therefore, small cells improve overall capacity in the areas of wireless networks where data demand is the greatest. A second grouping of customers for small cells are the cable companies like Comcast, which has its Xfinity mobile service, and Charter Communications, which has its Spectrum mobile service. These companies use small cells to augment these wireless services. So as we can tell from the customer base, small cells are particularly well positioned to support wireless carrier deployments of spectrum, especially at high band millimeter wave frequencies, where traditional tower sites are not well suited to maximize capacity. Particularly, because these higher frequencies travel shorter distances, this means that the antenna or node needs to be closer to the user, which small cells can do. In terms of contract terms, small cell contracts are often 10 to 15 years in initial term, with multiple five-year renewals and built-in escalators of 1% to 1.5% per year. Finally, let's discuss who are the actual providers of small cells. Given the significant upfront capital investment required to build both the fiber and small cell networks, the U.S. wireless carriers have often relied on independent third-party providers for a significant portion of their small cell deployments. Examples of the leading providers of small cells in the United States include Crown Castle, which has 50,000 small cell nodes on air, and this rises to 70,000 small cells, including those under contract but not yet built out. Second is Extinet Systems, which has 32,300 nodes, although the majority of them are distributed antenna system sites, which we'll touch on later, and it has 430 networks. Third is Verizon, which is actually self-performing the small cells for its own use. And in 2020, Verizon deployed 10,000 small cells in order to use more of its high band millimeter wave spectrum for what it brands as 5G ultra wideband. Fourth is Zeo, which has over 2,500 small cell nodes. And fifth is Unity Group, which has 2,400 small cell nodes installed or in backlog. It's also worth highlighting one more small cell provider, which is not shown here, but is called Freshwave Group, 
which is owned by Colony Capital, and they have 5,000 nodes in the United Kingdom and 150 networks. With that detailed review of small cells complete, let's move on to a similar framework for distributed antenna systems, or DAS. So distributed antenna systems address the capacity and speed requirements from an indoor perspective. These systems provide coverage and capacity to the indoor environment and reduce the network load on cellular towers, which improves overall network performance. Distributed antenna systems range from small, single-carrier, single-band, low-capacity systems for use in enterprise buildings, all the way up to large, multi-carrier, multi-band systems for use in high-capacity public venues. If we think about the physical asset, distributed antenna systems are deployed in high-demand venues, such as a stadium, hospital, shopping mall, casino, racetrack, convention center, airport, subway station, and tunnel. If we think about the two unique purposes for in-building deployments, you can supplement an area which has low coverage, like a subway station, or you can supplement an area which has high-density needs, such as a sports stadium. Let's take a real-world example. American Tower, the largest tower company globally, also has a significant distributed antenna system business. American Tower installed DAS systems at five of International Speedway's racetracks for motorsports. International Speedway hosts the Daytona 500 NASCAR Cup Series. Depending on the event and the size of the particular venue where the race is being held, there could be anywhere from 20,000 to 100,000 people attending an event at a single track. The majority of these people will want cellular connectivity, and American Tower's DAS Solutions supports users receiving optimal coverage during race day. So these distributed antenna systems are a wireless network structured as a number of antennas that are connected to and distribute signals from a common base station via fiber. Specifically, DAS is deployed within a discrete location, building, venue, or structure. The base station acts like a head end, meaning it holds all of the electronics for a footprint of antennas. The base station radio is a single unit connected via fiber to the DAS antennas and can be located at a remote site because of the minimal signal loss over the fiber. Recall that small cells are different and require radios to be co-located near each antenna. Let's use an example of a typical office building to understand some of the key components of distributed antenna systems and how they are deployed. The office building's distributed antenna system has four key components. Number one is the equipment room. This is a telecommunications rack delivering power and signal to the telecom closet while backhauling traffic to the mobile network. Number two is the telecom closet. This is a freestanding or wall-mounted rack for managing and interconnecting the cabling between the cellular and Wi-Fi devices and the equipment room we just spoke about. Number three are cellular devices. This is a single antenna supporting multiple wireless carriers and frequency bands for cellular voice, 4G LTE, and 5G communications. Fourth is Wi-Fi. This is a single cable run carrying low voltage power and high speed data, reaching up to 100 meters from the telecom closet. So moving on now to the customers of distributed antenna systems. And once again, the main customers of DAS are the wireless carriers. Think Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. As there are generally few options for providing competitive in-building coverage, these DAS systems have tenancy levels that range between two to four carriers in the United States. So sometimes all of Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile are on the same system in the same building. Distributed antenna systems are typically classified into four different types, depending on the type of building that they are intended to provide coverage and capacity for. First is standalone DAS in the bottom left corner. These are self-contained mini base stations. Examples where these are used are at the home or in a branch office. The purpose of this is to provide support for one user and up to 100 users. This system can host one to four different frequency bands or wireless carriers. 
Moving up and to the right, CRAN DAS is the second type of deployment. This emerged as a new approach to address the neutral host enterprise market. The majority of baseband processing is centralized in a baseband controller that provides capacity while radio points are distributed throughout the building and provide coverage. Examples of where this is used are in hospitals and high-rise office. The purpose of this is to provide support for up to 10,000 users, and this system can host one to five different frequency bands or wireless carriers. Moving further up and to the right, number three is Enterprise DAS. These systems solve the need for robust, scalable, multi-carrier mobile communications with coverage and capacity for enterprises and large venues. These systems utilize the fiber optic and ethernet structured cabling architecture common to many enterprises and commercial buildings, making it easier for IT professionals to deploy. Examples of where these systems are used are in shopping malls and convention centers. The purpose of these are to provide support for tens of thousands of users, and they can host up to six different frequency bands or wireless carriers. Finally, moving furthest up and to the right is what's simply known as DAS, and these systems are a tower baseband unit or base transceiver station with radio frequency or common public radio interface, short for CPRI, which are used for signal distribution. Examples of where these are used are in major airports and large stadiums. Their purpose is to provide support for hundreds of thousands of users simultaneously and they can host more than six different frequency bands or wireless carriers. Moving on now to contract terms. For distributed antenna systems, they have similar contract terms to small cells, which are often 10 to 15 years in initial term. Finally, let's touch on the providers of distributed antenna systems in the United States. First is Boingo Wireless, which operates 73 DAS networks containing 40,800 DAS nodes. This makes Boingo the largest operator of indoor DAS networks in the world. Second is Extinet Systems, which has 32,300 nodes, which are mainly DAS sites. Extinet also has 430 networks. Finally, number three is American Tower, which owns approximately 500 DAS networks and 1,774 DAS nodes. Specifically, 407 of these DAS nodes are in the United States, 1,079 of these DAS nodes are in India, and 231 of these DAS nodes are in Latin America, with the remainder being in Africa and Europe. So those three are the key providers. With that, we hope you have a better understanding of both small cells and distributed antenna systems. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.